for those of you who don't know, it's a memoir about my four-year experience as a professional dominatrix. Um, and also a drug addict. Not a professional drug addict. That was kind of a hack, actually. Um, but I don't think this needs much explanation. Oh, one thing. In, uh, towards the end of this, I describe a session with a client named Vinny, and Vinny's thing, one of his things, as you'll hear, um, was that he wanted, he liked to have a whole bunch of dominatrixes in the room with him, and he wanted everyone to have a completely blank face the whole time, which was kind of convenient sometimes. There isn't anywhere to hide in Tiffany's. The store is enormous and the jewelry is small. The 25 foot ceilings don't accommodate much more than a few chandeliers and the fog of luxury that rises from those long glass display counters. On my first visit to Tiffany's, I breathed it in and smiled. The women behind the counter smiled back. I had loved breakfast at Tiffany since adolescence, but I lived in New York for years without ever setting foot in the famous flagship store on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 57th. There were two reasons for this. One, I didn't believe in diamonds. That is, I knew that the racket of luxury goods and their value, invented merely to give those with too much money something to waste it on, was a disgusting hoax. My mother had always shaken her head at luxury cars and considered them tantamount to flipping all the poor people in the world the finger. To her, status resulted from humanism, not ostentation. I fancied myself too smart for Tiffany's. Second, I didn't feel like I belonged there. Not that I grew up poor. In fact, I was shocked to find out as an adult how much we had during my childhood. But both my parents grew up poor, and poor children either turn into adults who worship money or firmly don't and my parents belonged to the latter group, so I never felt privileged. And while my disbelief in diamonds was tinged with pride, I still grew up in this culture and no one is immune to the magic of luxury. Women who walked into Tiffany's did so swathed in a confidence I'd never had. A part of me knew that if I walked into Tiffany's, my raised by hippie shabbiness would emanate from me like a stench, draw glares, and the discomfort of not belonging would eventually drive me back out that revolving door, humiliated. I might have been a good many admirable things, but I was no Audrey Hepburn. A year at the dungeon changed all that. I walked just about everywhere swathed in confidence now, and somehow it didn't matter that I didn't believe in luxury goods, only that I now wanted them. I walked into Tiffany's in my red lipstick heels and fur trim coat and felt completely at ease. I strolled along the carpeted floor, peering into the displays. I tried on a diamond bracelet, accepted the clerk's compliments with a smile, and finally settled on a silver locket, its chain a slender, shining thread cool against my neck. As far as Tiffany's goes, a modest purchase, but spending many hundreds of dollars on something I absolutely did not need was, to me, a thrilling extravagance. In the summer of 2003, I had money. Rolls of it nestled between my paired socks and under my growing collection of slippery underthings, always more money for less fabric. There were 50 and $100 bills tucked inside certain books, Les Fleurs du Mal, a, flat, a fat Dessaud collection, a Bible with split binding. I found distressed twenties in jacket pockets, at the bottoms of purses, and in the laundromat dryer until I no longer did my own laundry. When you work real jobs, jobs whose work consumes whole days ticked by on wall-mounted clocks, you know what you're spending when you hand money over a counter. A pair of shoes equals five hours of washing tourists, dirty sheets, and toilets. A taxi from Midtown to Bed-Stuy at 2 a.m. equals four hours of scrubbing chowder and crusted pots and eating facefuls of noxious dis dishwasher steam. A 30-minute spree in Victoria's Secret equals 50 hours of scraping paint off the bottom of a boat. But what are you spending when a man hands you a hundred as you walk him out the door? Autumn once told me there was no such thing as free money, but I didn't believe her yet. For a time, I would do the calculations in my head or on scraps of paper in the dungeon's kitchen while I smoked. Take Dave, one of many Daves, who came to see me once a week to arm wrestle for about 20 minutes. A good tipper to begin with, he would often cough up an extra 50 for each of us if I brought in another mistress for a tournament. He would occasionally win with a third party, but never me. 
A half hour session cost him $100, 50 of which went to me, plus the $100 tip. If the second girl came in, the extra 50 left him with 200 for about 25 minutes work. That's $8 a minute. What's three minutes of arm wrestling and false eyelashes for a cab ride to Brooklyn that saves you an hour in travel time, not to mention the stench of the 34th Street subway station? Worth it from any angle I could see. Was it even work? Some sessions were. Handling clients who didn't wipe properly was work. Cleaning up an enema spill from the medical room, work. Relentlessly spanking anyone for an hour is work. But I had never considered work something that shaped you. It was more like styrofoam packing peanuts, stuff that took up a lot of space but was necessary for a certain degree of comfort. It certainly didn't define you. Being a dominatrix so quickly became a part of my identity. I watched it happen, watched myself turn into the women I'd seen on the day of my interview. It bore such intangible results that I couldn't class it with any kind of work I'd ever done for money. It changed me. And it did add a little class to my life, but only in certain areas. The last time I shot heroin was the day I moved upstairs from Autumn. The tiny Williamsburg studio wasn't worth what I paid for it, but it was mine. My bedroom window looked out over our landlord's concrete patio. All day, the harpy matriarch would sit out on a plastic chair and scream at her husband and adult daughter in Italian, prompting the daughter to then scream at her own children in Brooklynese, leaving the children to torment the dog, an incessantly barking dachshund named Precious. Go the fuck to sleep was their nightly refrain. I swear this was well before that book came out. I got burned. Autumn was out of town when I moved in, so I enlisted the help of an old boyfriend to carry my crates of books up the staircase. He brought with him five bags of South Boston dope and a syringe the size of a flashlight. What am I supposed to do with this monstrosity, I said. I couldn't get to the needle exchange before I caught the bus, he said, so I had to steal it from my doctor. Junkie logic. You know you can buy them at Dwayne Reed here. He rolled his eyes. Oh, okay, sure. You ride the train back into the city and go to the pharmacy. I will be here when you get back, enjoying these drugs. So I stuck that javelin in, into my arm, and as soon as we could move, we moved. It had been weeks since I'd gotten high, the longest I'd gone in years, so it was ironic that that was the night my problem became apparent to my coworkers at the dungeon. A few hours after moving, I was in session with Vinny and four other mistresses. As usual, we occupied Med 3, sweating beneath the mirrored ceilings and maintaining our stony faces. Bella was naked on a footstool, her blasé expression appropriate for once. Don't smile, Vinny scolded the new girl, Sasha, as she tortured his nipples with a pair of long-handled clamps. Camille held his arms behind the upright examination table, her bored face resting against the side of his headrest, watching the wall-mounted television. On the screen, a pot-bellied man in riding pants whipped a woman tied to a wooden post. Hay lay scattered around their feet in an obviously haphazard attempt to create a barn atmosphere. Vinny preferred those videos that might have been taped in someone's actual basement or backyard. His favorites featured older women, such as Grand Milfs Go Down, unshaven women, Hair Suit Honey Seven, and stars with cellulite pot bellies and bad teeth. A part of me liked him for rejecting the usual choreographed silicone-enhanced fare. Miss Kay, a veteran with the dual honors of an Ivy League degree in architecture and the roundest ass ever seen on a woman of her stature and proportions, held a butt plug in place with one gloved hand. Situated between his stirruped feet, I teased his urethra with the tip of a catheter. The tube of rubber was as long as my arm and thin as a knitting needle. No, 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 Vinny moaned, jerking against Camille's grasp. He spoke in his slave voice, which was higher pitched and went unheeded. He had a safe word, as most sessions did, a code word to call out when no stop could be mistaken for part of the scene. Vinny's safe word was red, but he never used it because we could always tell his real voice from his fantasy one. Vinny provided a classic case of topping from the bottom. He wasn't submissive, but had a submissive fantasy, so we pretended to dominate him under meticulous stage direction. He wasn't the worst case of this, but it added to the tedium of his fantasy. Like any addict, Vinny had a high tolerance, and that night was not one of his easier ones. The hour felt interminable. Vinny wheezed and mewed, even his hairy shins slick with effort. Sweat slid off my forearm and down the length of the orange catheter. 
Bella sighed, looking down to check her nails as she flicked her own nipples. Miss Kay wiggled the butt plug with one hand and reached up to rub her back with the other. Sasha increased the pressure of her clamps, Vinny's moaning, building, 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 and then waning. He did not look like a man indulging in lascivious pleasure. He looked like a man suffering from painful constipation. He was working harder than any of us, and his face began to take on a maniacal look of desperation. Then, it looked like it might happen. We all increased our effort, threw ourselves into as passionate an act of apathy as we could muster. Vinny announced, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and then my stomach turned. The catheter hit the floor with a little slap, like the tail of something. I lunged for the sink under the television and vomited into it. It wasn't the first time Vinny had failed to climax by the end of his session, but it was the first time my coworkers had ever looked at me that way. I'm sick, I offered as they filed out, pushing their damp hair off their foreheads. Vinny had booked the session with me, so I stayed to clean up and walk him out. When he got out of the shower, I had already finished cleaning and sat on the disinfected examination table. Vinny smiled at me, removed the towel from his waist, and began buffing his shoulders and back with it. I used to have a coke problem, you know, he said. Oh yeah? I stared at his genitals. They jiggled beneath his belly, purple and withered. You're on heroin, aren't you? I know what it looks like. I really just used to have a problem, I said. I only do it once in a while now. His knowing look made me want to punch him in the face. Thank you. Woo!